Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're logging in from or checking out uh, this live stream. Welcome. My name is Glenn Mulcahy. I'm the host for Love of the Game Virtual Summits podcast and our live stream series. And I'm really excited for this one that's upcoming. It's been a um, dialogue in progress for a couple of months with Taylor Cook, who is a high performance coach, professional hockey goaltender. Uh, after learning to overcome adversity through her hockey career, Taylor's mission to help others build a resilient mindset. She offers one on one coaching, brain training for athletes, and more online courses through Elite Athlete Performance. Our dialogue started a few months back in terms of, you know, bringing uh, some awareness in terms of this series, See Her, Be Her, Creating Your Future in Women's Hockey. And along with us, we've got a couple of amazing presenters that will be sharing. Um, a webinar type presentation. Uh, without further ado, I want to hand it over to uh, Taylor. If you can share some insight, um, you know, the reasons for being in terms of why we're going down this path in terms of this series. Yeah, for sure. And thanks for thanks for having me here. I'm I'm super excited to be here. Like we like you said, it's been a long time in the making. Um, but originally, what what kind of brought this idea up is I was having a conversation with my coach um, back home and. We were discussing how we really wish that we had access to the resources that there are today when we were playing in like the PWHL and like the junior leagues um, and how we really didn't have much of an understanding of the, the route to take in terms of going to play at university or going to play professionally. And it just kind of was something that we pieced together along the way. Um, but now there's so many different resources and uh, tools for young athletes to access and use in terms of uh, growing their game, both physically and mentally. And that's going to help them to get to that next level and get to the university level. And I think that's kind of what sparked, um, you know, the, the idea of having Pete and Sasha come on and talk about the recruitment process and how, uh, imperative it is for young athletes to understand that process so they can utilize it and um, just like apply those tools and strategies that they have and and be able to make it to university or collegiate level. Yeah, and I think uh, the tips and tricks that they're going to share based on our initial discussion is going to be pretty amazing because I even learned uh, a ton of nuggets in that first hour we chatted. So um, I'm just going to hand it over now uh, to Pete and Sasha. So Pete Montana is the Director of Player Development at the Ontario Hockey Academy in Cornwall, Ontario. The OHA is a private uh, secondary school that offers university prep academics and offers an Ontario Ministry of Education secondary school diploma. The Academy's university and or junior hockey placement rate close to 100% has propelled many student athletes into top caliber universities. And joining him will be Sasha Song, who has been in esports for eight seasons. She has been the head scout and recruiting coordinator at the University of Toronto, bringing many key pieces of their 2019-20 OUA Macaw Cup championship team and Laurentian University. Now she is a scouting consultant for multiple youth sports programs. Sasha has earned multiple post-secondary degrees, including a medical degree and as a medical editor by day. So without further ado, we're going to hand it over to the two of you to uh, walk us through your presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, is the slideshow, uh, do we have the slideshow? Perfect. Perfect. Um, so if you can just go to the next slide. So, um, so these are just some of the things that we're, that Pete and I are going to be discussing uh, throughout uh, the presentation. So, um, as mentioned, my background is as is on the scouting and recruiting side uh, for U Sports, which is the Canadian University uh, varsity uh, level sports. Um, and Pete has a lot of experience as well. Pete, do you want to talk about your experience with the university sport? Uh, well, basically, it's. Um... Uh, because of what I do here at the Academy, I'm involved with both the NCAA uh, U-Sport and the ACHA, uh, as well as in some small degree ACAC, which is an Alberta uh, Colleges Conference. Um, I interact with uh, university varsity coaches on a daily basis, like in several a day. So we've got some terrific insight here on things that uh, 
that, that the average student athlete should know. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to help them with the recruiting process. Awesome. Okay, next. Next, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, one of the big things that, that right off the bat that we have to talk about is how to choose the right university for you. So, um, you know, when we're, sorry, cat. <laughs> um, so uh, when we're, you know, we're, like we're all here because of interest in, in, in university hockey and sport, but the end of the day, the number one thing that you have to look at when choosing a university is the academics because you need to go to school to set yourself up for a career, especially when you're talking about about uh, you know female sport, women in sport. Um, so the academic part is is huge, and I probably when I you know as a recruiter, I would spend just really probably just as much time going and, and reviewing the academic programs that uh, that my schools that I was working for offered, as well as exploring the academic interests of the players that that I was recruiting and the players that were making inquiries into into my school and my hockey program um, so that is one of the most important things that you do have to consider um, really the way that you have to go into it in terms of your mindset is try to find the school that fits for you academically and and, and campus environments and hockey is a bonus um, because if you're not happy with where you're living and what you're what you're studying the program that you're studying that's going to affect your athletic performance so finding the right program pursuing what you're interested in studying as well as finding the right campus so well, every university has its, has its pros and cons. Um, there are some universities that are very small, like University of Toronto, where I was at. It's right in the heart of downtown Toronto, 80,000 students, and, uh, you know, in a very urban environment. And that kind of environment isn't the right fit for everyone. Um, if you're not comfortable being in the big city, then you're, you know, that's, that's going to be, that's going to make life a bit more challenging for you. Whereas if you love the city and if you want to be in a big center, then it's perfect. Um, you know, so, so taking a close look and getting a feel for the actual campuses and the cities that these campuses are in is really important because again, it affects, it, it, it affects everything else. It affects, you know, your, your, just your overall well being, your ability to perform academically and athletically. Um, so that's, you know, that is one of the biggest pieces that that I do emphasize that uh, you know you need to look at the academic and campus environment piece. Uh, really, those should be really those need to take priority over the hockey piece. If if I could uh, add to that, Sasha, one of the things that uh, we talk about frequently with our student athletes, and just to be clear, I work on the on the female side of our program here, um, and. Uh, we've actually told them stories where we've had players that have chosen their university and actually had a full ride to a program uh, in the NCAA. And after they got there, disliked the program a great deal. They were fine with the hockey, but they weren't happy with their academic side. So we always tell our players the exact same thing. Choose your school for academics first, because should anything happen to your hockey where it ends, you better like the school that you're going to, and it better have what you need for, for what you're going to uh, move on to later on in life, because um, you kind of get one shot at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not to say that, you know, uh, don't plan for hockey, but there are so many factors that come into play. Like for example, just the last, the last year, um, you know, and we'll touch a little bit more on how COVID has affected recruiting. Um, but, you know, if you weren't happy with, the academic program that you were studying, the school that you were at, uh, in youth sports at least, there was no sport for the entire year. So would you have been happy, you know, with hockey removed for, and, and that was something that was completely out of your control. Um, we've also unfortunately seen players in every program across the country have their careers, their playing careers end early because of injury. And a lot of times that is, you know, that's, you don't plan for that either. So if something like that were to, you know, hopefully, hopefully that's not something you ever have to deal with, but if that were to happen, are you happy? You know, is this the school for you if hockey is taken out of the equation? Um, so, and one of the other pieces that we, you know, that, that you, that also does need to be considered is the financial aspect. So depending on where you're coming from, if you're coming from Canada, um, looking at a youth sports school or looking at going to an NCAA school, um, 
the reality of women's sport is that there are very few true full rides, full ride scholarships, um, you know, across U sports and NCAA. And, uh, you know, um, and so that, that is something that you also do have to take into consideration as well. And that's maybe something more that you'd have to sit down and discuss with your parents. But the reality is, is that there are very few true full athletic uh, scholarships for hockey. Um, Speaking from the Canadian perspective, one of the, uh, you know, there, there are ways to earn quite a bit of scholarship money, but you just have to be a little bit creative. You can earn quite a bit if you combine the athletic scholarships with the, with academics and with, and various external scholarships such as leadership and so on. But that, you know, that may be something that you do ask, also have to keep in mind. Yeah, actually we, um, we see most of what ends up being a full ride scholarship here um, you know, to the university, particularly in the NCAA, uh, is a com combination of your academic and your athletic. Uh, there are, there aren't that many Ohio States in the world. And, um, the, those particular schools that have a great deal of money in their programs, uh, they're very careful about how they spend it. So, uh, there is money, there is, there is a lot of it available, but you just have to, as Sasha says, be very aware of, you know, when you're talking to coaches from, universities both north and south of the border be very clear on what it is that you're that is available to you mm -hmm. yeah because unfortunately we another thing that we see is a number every year there's a number of players who committed to ncaa division one and they're only there for a year they transfer back to a u sports program because after one year they can no longer afford it because yes they might have gotten a lot of the tuition covered but they didn't take into account living expenses books you know all basically basically everything like there there's so many other added expenses that come into play with going to university and so that's you know every year every year there there's there are student athletes that come back from ncaa because they can't afford uh you know the other expenses. Uh, next. So um, this was posted, uh, you know, this past summer. So in terms of the recruiting rules, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the various rules for all the different levels of uh, women's hockey, university women's hockey available. So within U sports, there actually aren't very many rules at all. So I don't have any restrictions on how, on when I, when I'm allowed to start talking to players, uh, when I'm allowed to start emailing with them, phone calls, direct face to face meetings, um, that can start basically at any point. So uh, whenever, you know, whenever either myself, uh, you know, my, the head coach of the program or uh, the student athletes themselves, the prospective student athletes themselves reach out. Um, so I don't have, I don't actually have any restrictions um, like the NCAA does. Um, that being said, a lot of times, uh, you know, most schools will not really start talking to players uh, on the U sports side. Um, I would say grade 10 is when a lot of conversations, a lot of initial conversations might start, but, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of actual rules and regulations, uh, we don't really have an awful lot in youth sports. Um, during the past year, there was a blackout on campus visits. So that made things a little bit tricky, but, uh, that has been, you know, we, that that's been lifted. Uh, so, and again, campus visits are important because you need to, re, you know, as, as mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, you really do need to get a good feel for the campus and for, you know, the environment that you're going to be living in. Next. Okay, it's a little bit different. Uh, matter of fact, it's a great deal different south of the border. Um, we'll uh, we'll talk about uh, Division One to start with, and this is just a little timeline I've actually uh, built for our own players and parents so they understand the process at, as it pertains to Division One. These rules just changed a couple of years ago. Um, they were fairly lax prior to that, and you were seeing grade eights and nines commit to Division One programs. Uh, the NCAA decided that that probably wasn't the best thing, and so they've come up with what I think is is actually a great uh, a great system now. So the first time any contact can happen between a Division One school the coaching staff and a student athlete is June 15th, right before you go into grade 11. So that summer uh, before grade 11 is the first time you can reach out to them and 
hear back. You can reach out to him prior to that, but you're probably not going to hear anything back. Um, and then secondly, uh, by August 1st of that same summer, schools can actually make offers and players can commit. Uh, it, it, it varies from player to player. Uh, we see here, we see a lot more players, you know, committing um, in grade 11, division one. But we do have the odd uh, division uh, division one commit in grade twelve. It's changed a lot because of uh, COVID, and again, we'll discuss that at one point. But this is basically the uh, the general rule in terms of division one. Now, for division three and the ACHA, you may not be fully aware of the American Collegiate Hockey Association. It's completely separate from the NCAA. Um, division three and the ACHA, for all intents and purposes, are similar to U Sport. There are no rules. Um, other than tampering and, and bribes and those sorts of things. But uh, for Division three, we typically don't see students commit to a Division three school until they're in their grade 12 year, and in many cases, not until after Christmas of their grade 12 year. Uh, we What we like to say is here, we like to wait for the Division one dream to die before the Division three step in to try and recruit a player. They're kind of waiting to see who... Uh, maybe got missed or maybe decided they didn't want to go a Division One route or U-Sport, and uh, then they'll start talking to them. ACHA is very similar. They tend to wait till grade 12, and typically uh, they may want to jump a little earlier to try and get a player to commit before Christmas, but for the most part, uh, those two programs, both the Division Three NCAA and ACHA, will typically wait till grade 12 until until after Christmas. Yeah, and in terms of where U Sports fits in uh, with with the uh, American programs, um, U Sports so Division One typically uh, is is uh, is the in terms of level of competition is considered the highest. The best U the best NCAA Division One teams are, you know, a lot of a lot of Team USA, Team Canada players, and so on. Um, U Sports would come in in between uh, NCAA Division One and Division Three, and so actually. Um, Excuse me. The best, the best U Sports teams are probably competitive to about uh, the midpoint of NCAA Division One, um, and again, the you know the the best NCAA Division Three schools are are competitive with the bottom half of the, the U Sports programs. You know, and I would I would like to point out because I know most student athletes I talk to right across North America, um, everybody wants Division One NCAA. That's the dream, and uh, it's a good dream. And it's attainable for a number of players, but I wouldn't want you to discount particularly U sport where academics in Canada is outstanding. Um, Sash and I've had this conversation more than once. It's, it's harder to get into the university of Toronto than it is to get into some of the Ivy league schools. So yeah. Um, yeah, when I was a recruiter at university of Toronto, I actually had a player that I had to turn away because she was never, she wasn't going to get into the university of Toronto and she ended up going to an Ivy League school instead. Well, that that tells that says a lot. Um, and and Division Three is very 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 good. The top Division Three schools are um, exceptional. Uh, they have exceptional hockey programs, and they're they have exceptional educational institutions. There's actually something we call it's kind of a mini Ivy League in Division Three called NASCAC, and those schools carry as much weight academically as the Ivy Leagues do. So. Uh, it's really important that you investigate, you know, all of the possibilities that are out there. Uh, so you fully understand, but I would never, ever tell a player that they shouldn't, uh, go to a division three school or an ACHA school because the ACHA has money too. And at the end of the day, you're trying to get your education paid for, because that is the single most important thing. Yeah. I would actually say really the biggest difference between NCAA Division One, U Sports Division Three, ACHA is the type of campus environment and the type of the academic structure, right? So the reason why Division Three schools are Division Three is because it is is simply because of the size of the school. They just tend to be much smaller schools. So if you are looking for a much more personal learning environment, a lot of Division Three schools are, you know, they 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 can provide that for you, and you know, in a way that Division One and you some and U Sports schools might not be able to. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, we're two and a half hours away from Norwich University, which is in Northfield, Vermont, and it is the town, pretty much, or Morrisville State, which is in 
New York, uh, there's one stoplight in the town. There's these are small, very small communities, very good schools, and exceptional hockey programs. So, uh, just some things to look for when you're when you're considering your program that you want to go to. And I just wanted uh, to quickly add, you guys, um, like there's also very small towns and like small schools in U Sports as well. And like, yeah. and I, I know you both know this already, but just so like the listeners know. They are around, especially like I went to school on the East Coast. I was like in a hockey town on a hockey hill. We had a hockey rivalry with with the school just down the way from us, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about finding. Again, it's all about finding the right environment for you, right? Like I was at University of Toronto, eighty thousand students, and I was also at Laurentian, <laughs> seven thousand students. <laughs> Yeah, that's a huge difference, right? Yeah. And like I, at my school, I think we had like a sixty student cap on our classes, so like you really got to know your profs, like. Yeah. And I, I yeah. really appreciated that, right? But yeah. some other yeah. people would like to just to fit in with the crowd, and that's totally fine too. Yep, exactly. Yeah, Laurentian, we were eighteen to one student to professor ratio, <laughs> which is smaller than a lot of high school classes in Ontario, which is smaller than most high school classes in Ontario. Yeah, absolutely, it is. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide, I guess. Hey, Sasha. Yep. Okay. So, how do I get scouted? Um, it's kind of a touchy question because depending on where you are watching this from, um, you may or may not like what I have to say, but I'm going to share my knowledge of of when we're recruiting student athletes to our program we're recruiting from all over the world. So as an example, my first year here, my team spoke nine different languages. Um, this year we have, and on the female side, we have uh, student athletes from Argentina, Mexico, Switzerland, Germany. Um, we have Five players from Korea, two of them aren't here right now because they're doing their pre-Olympic qualifiers. Great Britain, oh boy, Australia, New Zealand. I'm going to forget some, but you get the idea. Um, the reason they come here is because they have virtually no chance of being scouted where they play, which goes without saying. They're in countries where typically, I mean, who knew Lebanon has a women's national team? Who knew? But you're probably not getting scouted very often uh, because, of course, right now they don't they don't play all that much. Um, but it's the same within North America. You know, uh, there are about close to sixty thousand female players registered to play hockey in Ontario. There isn't sixty thousand players in the rest of the country combined. And so, what ends up happening is the best female hockey in the country is played in this province just it's just a matter of numbers and facts i mean the pwhl the provincial women's hockey league there's nothing like it anywhere else in canada it's a u22 league designed to uh you know get as much um uh recognition and attra attraction to their players as possible with with all university programs right actually uh, really there isn't another program another league like that in north america true Yes. I mean, it, that's, it's it. It's 20 teams. Well, it's a little bit bigger this year because they've expanded to, to uh, add some more teams this year. But for the most part, we're talking, you know, 25 to 30 teams. There's nothing like it in the rest of the country. So when I'm recruiting, say, a player from out west, we'll say British Columbia as an example, it's very difficult for me to try and help the student athlete and their family understand the difference between the U-22 hockey that's played in this province and through a lot of the U.S. Uh, uh, states that we go to to play and what they see at their highest level, which is U18. It's very difficult to try and help them understand that. Um, we have players here that, um, <coughs> excuse me, joined us this year. Should have got water like you guys did. Um, anyway, uh, played in their first U22 game. And looked at me and, and they were absolutely in shock at the level. Excuse me again. Yeah, so just to add on that, like, you know, in, in Ontario, there are at the, both the U22 and U18 levels, there are roughly on 70 to 75 teams per year in, uh, in all of the, uh, you know, 
all, both Alberta and BC, there, there are six, each, each of those provinces has six U18 teams and what, maybe, maybe four prep teams that are considered basically U22. Um, so, so both each of those provinces has maybe 10 teams versus 70 to 75. So it's, it's not that you won't get scouted or recruited if you happen to be in say, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, Alberta, BC, uh, a, a number of the U S states. Um, but the likelihood of how many times you're going to be seen is drastically reduced compared to what happens if you play in like a PWHL uh, or even, you know, the, the U18 AA in Ontario, which is AAA everywhere else in the country. I'm not sure why that is, but it is what it is. Even those programs um, get heavily scouted. And the, the problem is most universities, particularly the NCAA Division Ones, don't have the money to send their coaches scouting out West. Very few. When I'm out West recruiting and scouting, very, very rarely do I ever see NCAA Division One. I, I never see Division Three, um, and odd the odd time I'll see U Sport, but they only recruit from within the pretty much from within their province. It's rare that you would see, um, you know, um, U of A's head coach in Saskatchewan. It's very rare, uh, and very very rare. So it's important to to be able to play someplace where you are going to get seen. Now, if you happen to be in a province that isn't getting a lot of scouting, there are there are things that you can do, but again, um, we could talk about this for hours and, uh, basically it's, it's just, it's not as easy if you're not, uh, you know, playing hockey in a, an area that's being heavily scouted. Yep. I and mean, at the very from, least. Oh, sorry. Even from the university perspective, I, you know, um, we not only have all the best Ontario players here, but a lot of the best players from other provinces come and move here and they go to boarding school or billet to play in PWHL or with the U18 programs in Ontario. And so it's really hard for me to um, measure, to, to be able to assess what a player coming from, um, let's say, you know, the Nova Scotia League versus, you know, the Nova Scotia U18 AAA, how that player is going to do in, you know, in our league just because they don't play the level of competition is just the, the depth is not, it's, it's really hard to compare. And it's unfortunate and, and, and know it, maybe it's not fair, but um, it does make it more difficult. Now, having said that, I, I know that I know of several you know, players across the country that have uh, either been uh, picked up by a U sport program or, you know, a university program in North America um, in spite of where they're playing. Those typically tend to be, you know, your Team BC, Team Alberta, Team Saskatchewan, uh, U18 student athletes where um, they are going to get seen because they're going to play in a national stage. Um, but if you're not on a provincial team, it gets harder again. So I'm probably just um, prompted about a thousand questions. <laughs> So that's, I, I hope I answered that to some degree. It maybe you know, I'm trying really hard not to say you should all move to Ontario because um, that's not necessarily what I mean. It's not impossible, but it's less likely. If you look at uh, university rosters in all the uh, leagues that we're talking about, you will see that, well, I'll just give you an example. The majority, more well, pretty much half of Canada's national U18 team comes from Ontario. There's a reason for that. Or or players that are from other provinces that are playing in Ontario. Yes. So um, stack your questions up and <laughs> can get ready to ask away. Um, so that, that's all I have on that right now. Yeah, so why don't we move on to the next slide? Um, okay, so this is really important. Um, UDEF, so the best way, the, the one way to essentially guarantee that a university scout will see you is by reaching out to the universities, to the university coaches, um, sending them an email. So what every U sports program does, every D3, even a lot, most of the D1s, um, is anybody who sends them an email, we put your name, we, you know, we put your name and number on uh, team on a running list 
And so when we are at a showcase event or just, you know, out at the rank watching league games, we will make a point to look for your number and make sure that we get notes on your number. Um, if you don't email, then you're leaving it up to chance and, you know, because a lot of things can happen at, at these showcases. So, for example, um, Stony Creek is one of the major, is, is the biggest, you know, showcase in North America for women's hockey. And there are seven rinks running at the same time. So seven games playing at the same time, um, four in one facility, three in another. So when I go into a tournament like that, like I, I, I can only, st I typically only stay at a game for a period and a half to two periods because I would rather come back and watch, you know, check in on every team three or four times than watch one entire game and then not be able to come back and see that team again. So think about within two periods, there could be, you could be a very good player and still get missed. Maybe there are a lot of penalties in the game that just completely disrupts a lot of whistles. There's no flow to it. Like, you know, there's so many things that could happen that could, you know, that, that could mean that you don't get seen. Um, Cause again, you know, two periods and then I'm jumping to the next one. So, but if you've emailed me, then I'm looking for I'm I'm making an effort to look for your number and making sure that I get notes that you, notes on you at some point over that showcase weekend. Um, so, you know, to going back to the, some of the timelines, um, you know, Pete had mentioned with NCAA Division ones that they are not allowed to have any contact with student athletes before grade eleven. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't email them and get on their list before grade eleven. It just means that they. By their rules, they don't expect don't expect an answer because they that is that is not allowed. But they will still put your name down and go you know and go and watch you you know and get you know and start scouting you. Um, so where that's you know and even for Canadian schools, I would definitely encourage you to consider reaching out in grade ten or grade eleven. Um, unfortunately, if you wait until grade twelve, that's often too late. Uh, you know the way that recruiting has gone. Um, even even uh, when I started uh, seven eight like you know in my first year seven eight years ago, you could email in grade twelve and still be very competitive. But that's if for in Canada, but that's changed really nowadays. If you if you email in grade twelve, that's far too late. Um, so one of the other pieces of why emailing early is important. So it's not only that I start making notes on you earlier, but you get to you get to start building a relationship with that school with that coaching and scouting staff a lot earlier. And so for, you know, for the programs that I've worked with, if there are two players with very similar skill sets that we've got them, you know, rated the same, if I've gotten to know one player over the past two, three years, and I've gotten to know her family, um, you know, and, and just really built a relationship with her versus a player who I've only, you know, I've only, received an email and I've only talked to you, you know, maybe briefly once in grade 12. Well, like I'm going to be a lot more comfortable with, with the player that I've gotten to know over a couple of years. Right. And so even though there might not, you know, they're, they're very similar players or maybe even the, you know, player B is slightly better unless player B is significantly better to make me want to go take another look. I'm going to go with, I, I'm going to go with the people who I'm comfortable with. Right. Because uh, at the end of the day, it's not just skill like it's, you know, when you're playing university hockey, one of the big differences with minor hockey is it's you, like it's an, it's your entire life. Like you are there, like you live there to go to school, like your teammates are your like they really, truly are your family in a in a way that, you know, like you may be on a very you may have some have been on some really close teams. At, at you, you know, coming up, growing up, like with your U18s, U16, so on. But it's it really is not, you know, it's it's really not the same when you are living and you know when you're away from home and you're completely independent uh, with the university girls. Sasha, if I could add to this, um, Taylor actually asked a really good question before we started the the uh, the process today, and and the question was about character and. Uh, I frequently, when we're talking to our student athletes here, um, you know, I mean, we're in a very fortunate position. We, you know, I'm a coach that lives with my team at the U22 level, and that's highly, highly unusual, but it's, it's very effective because the only two questions I ever get asked by a university recruiter are what kind of person are they? What kind of student are they? 
because everything else they can see. I never say to a recruiter, man, she's a hard worker. Never, ever. They can see if you're a hard worker, but they do want to know what kind of person you are and they do want to know if you're a good student. So my opportunity here is a little different than most because I get to live with my team. I see these players, these student athletes, 24 seven, almost 365 and know what kind of person they are because I also happen to live in the dorms. That's a really, really important part of the process because for Taylor to ask the question, it's, it reminded me that most university recruiters, and I know Sasha can speak to this. One of the things they're going to ask you is, are you a good person? I actually had one recruiter ask one of our players, do you think you're a good human? Because we only want good humans in our dressing room. So it's more than being able to put the puck in the net or being able to stop the puck or being a great defensive player or all those things that you think are important. They really care about the kinds of people they bring into their program. Yeah. So that's where, you know, the more time you have to build relationships with 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 university staffs like that is super super valuable um again it not only shows initiative which we do love but the fact that you know recruiting goes to both ways right like you as a student athlete you want someone you want a school that wants you but us as programs like we're the same way we want players who want to be at our school um on average uh i would get Oh, on average, um, I would probably have about 400 players per each recruiting class, uh, 400 different players that were interested in, you know, my, whatever U sports program I was with. And on average, there's only about five spots per year. So that's, uh, you know, that's a lot of interest and just it's, it's, it's uh, not a great numbers game, unfortunately. Um, so why don't we move on to the next slide? So how has COVID affected recruiting? Um, it has made the recruiting landscape very, very difficult. Um, gonna not gonna lie, like the 22, uh, you know, girls that are looking to go, plus student athletes that are looking to go to university and play next year, you guys are in an extremely difficult uh, position. Um, essentially what has happened, it has, is um, because U Sports canceled their entire season last year. Um, nobody, no current student athletes lost any eligibility. So what that means is that this year, there are two first year classes. Uh, the, the players that started university in, 20, in September 2020 and the players that started university in September 20, you know, this, this September. So there are two first year classes, but the other, you know, the other aspect of nobody losing eligibility is that essentially all current student athletes gained an extra year of eligibility so on the other on the other end of things players who normally would have graduated who would have used up all their eligibility um so in new sports we have five years so players that normally would be finished with their hockey careers because of they've, they've you know they've completed their eligibility in schooling because they now have that extra year uh, there are a number of players who are opting not to move on from, from university hockey. And because now with that extra year, they can finish their masters while still playing. So it's created an incredible backlog. Um, it's, I haven't seen anything like it in all my years. Um, you know, as mentioned, most years on average, I will have about five spots per pro, you know, there's about give or take five spots per program this year. Um, you know, and another thing that's impacted, uh, this is, this what these are, were some of uh, my former players at Laurentian, um, you know, there were a number of factors, but there have been a number of programs that have closed uh, in part due to, in large part due to finances and, and part of that, uh, you know, COVID contributed to. So the, the women's hockey program at Laurentian was cut. Um, program NCAA division one program, Robert Morris was cut over the summer as well. So that's fewer teams with, you know, fewer spots available plus, needing to find transfers for, you know, multiple teams worth of players. So, you know, as part of that process in the spring, I spoke with every single, you know, myself and the head coach, uh, we spoke with every single U sports program in Canada. And right now there are, 
there are there are only a handful of spots that are currently open for 22 when normally there would still be you know several like you know every school would still hold a couple of late openings that being said um we do anticipate spot that spots will open up um you know players that student athletes that basically haven't been <laughs> training for, you know they haven't been able to be in that team environment for a year there's going to be some some players that are coming back uh you know right now that are senior players and that might realize that okay no you know what i i had more time to focus on academics or explore other interests last year without hockey and they might choose to pursue that um so we do you know and th there's a variety of other uh situations that might that might pop up but um we so we do expect uh in youth sports at least over the next so as of right now there are virtually no spots but i would say that by the end of october early november we we anticipate spots opening up but again it's not going to be anywhere near the number of spots that are usually available for a given year um i will say though that i have spoken to um well probably close to 50 recruiters here in the last three weeks, both uh, U Sports and NCAA. And unfortunately, they still have to recruit for a graduating class as if there was no COVID. So there are schools that are looking for maybe two forwards and 2D and a goalie or, you know, whatever that number might be. There are spots available. The problem is the roster size is huge. So... They still need to recruit for that graduating class for that year. So they still need to recruit 22s for their graduating class. Uh, because if they don't, they're going to they're going to create a gap in their program. And that's the real challenge of this. Now, if you're a good player and a good student, you're going to find a home. If you're good and somebody wants you, trust me, they will make room. So the challenge will be for those players that are really fighting for a spot. Um, but there does seem to be some appetite to be able to at least grab a few players for that graduating class. Um, and like, like Sasha was saying, you know, I'm, I'm finding some teams with at least four different spots for different positions. Um, but really, who knows? It's, it's going to be a crapshoot. So yeah. you're going to, if you're a 22 grad, you're really going to have to work at it. And be patient, be willing, you have to be willing to be patient. So really what's, what's going to happen is that spots, you know, universities aren't going to know or, or they're not going to feel comfortable committing to spots until much later than usual is. So I do, I do expect that most schools will add at least a few, but whereas, you know, in a typical year, a whole bunch of offers would be going out right, right now. No offers are going out right now. Right. So it's, it's, you know, but I, I do think that that will happen, but it may not happen until it probably won't happen until mid November at the earliest. Um, so it's, you, you know, if you are currently in grade 12 or doing a post grad year, um, you know, there is still, you know, there, there will be opportunities, but you're going to have to be willing to be much more patient than, you know, previous classes. Up next. So um, emailing university coaches, just keep it short and sweet. <laughs> Again, we get hundreds and hundreds of emails. And so really at the end of the day, I only need to see, I really only care about the vital information that will let me identify you and know, is my school a potential fit for you, right? So if you're academic, you know, let's say you're interested, you have, you've got a specific academic interest. Well, maybe my school doesn't, you know, maybe I'm at a smaller school that doesn't offer what you're interested in right, then that's not going to be a great fit. Because again, you do need to, academics do need to be our priorities, or what, if, depending on what your academic average is, there are certain schools, certain programs where that's not going to be a fit. So really what I need is your name. Believe me, I, I have gotten emails without this before. I have gotten emails without any of this information from, you know, and it'll be from Jessica, whose email is hockey girl. <laughs> and I have just like I, I would love to watch you play, but I literally have no idea who you are. <laughs> um, so name, team, position, birth year, grad year. And so, you know, because sometimes there are differences in terms of 
you know, being willing to do a post-grad or if you are, ahead, you know, looking to graduate early, that's important. Um, additional information that I like to know, but it is an essential, is your height and which way you shoot. Now, the reason I like to know those two pieces of information, but again, they're not essential, is because that helps me identify you faster. So if I'm going into, if I'm going to watch you play for the first time, I can't start evaluating players until I know, until I, until I've got a handle on what you look like on the ice. And so if I know that I'm looking for um, a five foot ten right shot D, well, that makes that you know I can I can automatically eliminate all the left hand shots, right, and all the shorter players. So it just makes me it it just makes me be able to familiarize myself with what you look like on the ice a lot quicker if I have a height and which way you shoot. But again, not essential. Um, now, what about video? I don't know if this is applicable like yeah. these days. Uh, I used to when I was sending out my recruitment my recruitment uh, emails. So, what do you guys feel about like players sending in video? Don't send me a highlight video. I don't care. It shows me. It, it gives me nothing of value. Highlights, you know, if you if you send me a goal reel, that's that's great. But uh, you know, and we'll get touch on this in a bit as well. Um, it's it really doesn't give me anything of value uh, having just short snippets um, because you need to be a complete player, right? I need to see what you can do without the puck, right? Like the game is a lot more than the goals than than goals scored, right? That's just the flashy part, but I need to see a lot more. Um, one of the things that we do here, um, our players will include entire shifts. So one game, every single shift. So uh, in sequence. So the coach doesn't have to watch the entire game, but they can certainly uh, get an idea of, of all three zones and entire shifts. Very, very, very important. Yeah, That now, has the most about value. Goaltenders, though. Entire well, defensive zone. are a bit tough. Yeah, entire defensive zone. So basically, you know, um, if you can just have a I, – I personally like a more of a tripod, like where just from above, but – uh, GoPros as well. The, I see a lot of GoPros behind the nets, and I want to see basically from the time that the play, you know, is is beginning to enter your zone. So as early as like center ice, or but for sure as soon as the puck is over the blue line, I want to see everything because for goalies in particular. Um, so I was a goalie, so I I love I love evaluating goalies. Um, but what is, one of the aspects that is super important is I need to see your feet, how you know, and that goes beyond just the actual save process. I need to you know, because skating is super important for goalies. But I also need to see how you read the play. I need to see how you process the play before you know, before as the play is getting set up. I need to see how you read the play after a shot, right? And so if you're only showing little snippets of saves that that doesn't really give me much value because I can't see I can't see how you replays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we can go to the next slide, actually, because we're, we're transitioning into it pretty well. Um, but so I will also add with video, please do not tuck in your jerseys. Um, so it's it, it that's a challenge as well when you're when we're watching live. But on video, when you tuck your jersey in, it makes it extremely difficult to read the back of your jersey. So if I can't clearly see your numbers, then I don't know who you are. So um, as well, just a little I guess, quick anecdote from uh, when I was uh, evaluating for Team Ontario. Um, they are explicitly told that Team Ontario camps do not tuck in your jerseys. Because again, we need to be able to see the numbers on the back. Um, and particularly at the U16 camps, we would see players who, you know, the coaches were instructed on the benches, if, if a player has their jersey tucked in, just pull it out, you know, and remind them and remind them if they can't have it tucked in. We would sometimes see players immediately tuck their jersey back in. And we'd make note of who those players were, right? Because that's a very simple instruction that you're not – able or willing to follow for whatever reason. So that is that does raise a, that does raise a bit of a flag. So but especially now with like, you know, more and more games on video because again, it's it's hard to know with with some of the covid restrictions on, you know, there are certain there are certain restrictions in terms of 
where scouts can go in some in some instances. So video is going to be relied upon much more. So um, you'd really help us out a lot by not tucking in your jersey. <laughs> So um, we've kind of touched on uh, this a little bit, but what do we look for? So, um, you know, this is just, basically this is exclusively the on ice aspect, as we've discussed earlier in this talk. Um, the off ice, the character, just the getting to know, being comfortable with who you are as a person, that is huge. That, 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 that plays probably just as big a role as the on ice aspect, probably even bigger. Um, but in terms of on ice play, these are, these are a few of the things that are super important. So, excuse me, number one is skating, because at the end of the day, if you do not have the skating ability, if you don't have the speed to keep up with the pace of, with our pace of play, you know, and if your, if your, if your speed does not project to be able to keep up well with the university level pace of play, nothing else matters. If you can't keep up with the game, then it doesn't matter how good your hands are. It doesn't matter how good your shot is if you can't keep up. So skating is super, super important. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, the other aspect that I'm really going to highlight is how you play away from the puck. So one of the reasons why I try to emphasize this a lot for, uh, you know, for, for prospective student athletes is you have a lot more time and space than you realize at the U18 level, at the U22 level. So you, you can get away with poor off puck habits and it won't affect your play with the puck. But when you get to the university level, if you don't have good off puck habits, you'll never get the puck on your stick. So it doesn't matter what you can do with the puck. If you don't, if you don't take care of the game away from the puck, you're never gonna get the puck on your stick to show what, you know, to, to show off your hands or your shot or whatever that may be. So that attention to detail away from the puck, like that is huge. And really as well, like you're going to help yourself out in the transition to university hockey, because if you can play away from the puck, that basically, basically what the players that I want are, I want complete players. If you're playing at, you know, the double A in Ontario or triple A level of, on a prep team, you should have good puck skills, right? As, essentially as a prerequisite for playing at this level. Right. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to assume to a certain degree that you have that you can handle the puck well. So it's 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 more, OK, what can you bring as a total package? And that's where work ethic and consistency come into play, because if 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 I see that you're working hard every single shift in a game, it's OK if you make mistakes. But how do you battle through it? How do you respond? Do you let it throw off the entire game? You know, do you let it right? Like, do, are you like. You know, yeah, maybe maybe you have a game where none of the bounces are going your way. It happens. It happens sometimes. It happens to everyone. But how is how do you what is your work ethic like? What is your compete like? Are you continuing to battle? Um, and the other aspect is consistency. So the university university seasons are significantly shorter than your junior, your U eighteen those seasons. So in in the OUA in the Ontario uh, Ontario League. We only play, well, I guess it'll be, yeah, we play, I guess there'll be 22 regular season games. And our league in particular is extremely close. Um, a couple seasons ago, at the halfway point, there was a six-way tie uh, for second place. <laughs> so, yeah, Ryerson was at 27 points, and then, at, and then there was a six-way tie at 26 points. So that is essentially the entire playoffs <laughs> that, is, that was two points. So consistency, like every, literally every point matters. Um, in recent years, like it's gone down to the last weekend to, to, to determine playoff standings, playoffs, who's in, who's out, where the seedings. So, you know, and that's where work, the work ethic comes into play because if you're bringing a good work, you know, if you're bringing a high compete level and a good work ethic day in, day out, you're going to have that consistency that goes along with it. Do you have anything to add, Pete? Uh, no, I don't actually. Um, no, it's, I, listen, we, we just played an exhibition game against Carleton University last weekend uh, with our U22s. We lost 4-1, um, but don't let the score fool you. They outshot us 49-7, to and we did that because we wanted to show our girls what consistency looks like. 
and trust me, they saw it. Um, our goaltender stood on her head. I think she now has a full ride to Carlton University. But uh, yeah, it's it's extremely important because consistency is the one thing that tells a coach or a recruiter that if you're like this all the time, they can trust you. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, why don't we uh, open it up to questions now? Just coming back into the show. That was actually a lot of stuff I have never heard, considering I've been in the space for quite some time. The interesting nuggets on what the scouts look for, because I'm more I've been more involved on the male side, but you nail it on the head of you know, how are they as a person and how are they as a student? That literally is on the male side as well. And many parents don't understand the importance of the academics. So I have a couple of questions. Hopefully we'll get a few that come in here. There's a few watching on the different channels. Um, in terms of NCAA versus U Sports and ratio of scholarships on the athletic versus academic, is there similarities or differences? And if so, at what to what level? So I can uh, touch a little bit on the U Sports. So, so there are multiple levels to U Sports. Uh, athletic scholarships for women's hockey specifically. Um, so there has been something called the pilot project, which ha has been technically has expired, but has been renewed on one year basis for the past several years. Um, and that was what allowed university, you know, university women's hockey programs to give full, full athletic scholarships for hockey. Um, that we don't, uh, we don't expect that to be renewed. Like that will likely come to an end soon. And the main reason is because most schools, like it, it, no, very few places were actually able to take advantage of that. So at the use, so basically at the youth sports level, we were allowed to give full scholar, full athletic scholarships, but then the level below that is each individual conference. So there's four conferences in youth sports, Canada West, the Ontario University Athletics, um, RSEQ in Quebec and uh, Atlantic University Sport. And so each of those conferences then has their own rules about within within the U Sports, uh, what's what's allowed in U Sports. So for example, the OUA is the most restrictive out of all four conferences. So we, so technically like the maximum of what we can give in U Sports, like we were not, we're only allowed to cover tuition, I believe it is. Um, whereas some of the other conferences are allowed to, if they have the funding, cover tuition, room, and board. Um, so, and then the level below that is each individual institution. So every institution is funded differently, um, fund, funds their athletics department differently, and it it'll come down to each and and really it comes down to each individual institution. So, um, for example, there are some schools that that have. That, that really they rely a lot on fundraising for the bulk of their scholarship for their athletic scholarship money whereas there's other universities that have dedicated you know that that, that put aside dedicated amounts um, and one of the other actually another aspect of U sports scholarships so this is across all sports not just women's hockey is the amount the maximum amount of scholarship uh, money that each university program is allowed to give depends it, there's actually a formula that uses the number of academic all canadians that that program has so the better academically that a team does the more scholarship money that they are allowed to give yeah it's it's very different obviously in the us um the ncaa there's you know obviously there's a a lot more money uh, at the division one level than there is at the division three level and for the most part at the division three level there is no athletic money at all. It's all academic. Now, some of the schools that we deal with find other ways to throw in a bursary. Like if you were a good volunteer back home, there's an extra $5,000 there if you have a letter stating that you were a good volunteer back home. Um, but for the most part, uh, particularly if you're an international, it's extremely, um, it's cheaper to go to a Canadian university. Let's put it that way. It's a little bit tougher because the D3s do not, for the most part, have any athletic money. It's not unlike a lot of U sports schools. Uh, ACHA, all bets are off. They, the schools there, I'm, I'm, we're still learning because they're still relatively new to the game. But 
uh, I know a number of student athletes that have gone there and uh, have ended up with the equivalent of a full ride. So it, it kind of depends, like Sasha says, it really depends on each individual school and what their what their own rules are for their schools. Yeah. And that even applies to a lot of, to, to some of the D1s, like there are certain Division One conferences that don't allow athletic, uh, you know, that it, it has to all come from uh, academic funding and so on. Pretty much the idea. Our original chat when we were getting ready for this, we were talking about Ivy League schools don't offer athletic scholarships. No. It's mainly it's, it's no. only academic, and that's why I always encourage, especially when I talk to parents of players or players themselves, that you know focus on your grades first, the sport comes second, because down the road, um, the real percentage was chatting with somebody this morning, point zero three percent of kids will actually go on to play a really high level, the majority of them. Yeah. Hopefully, you didn't get a school, like yep. you get a university. Yep, that's, education. that's a very low percentage that will play beyond that, right? Yep, and that's that's again why why we emphasize, you know, when going through this process. Yes, like you you know you want to be a, a student athlete, you want to play women's hockey in university, but if 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 the if the school you know if let's say a school that's recruiting you doesn't have the academic program that of interest to you, then you have to really take a, a good hard look at whether this is the right decision for, for yourself in the long run. Yeah. We actually have a couple of players that are close to committing right now and um, they are waiting for their SATs because the SAT score is going to give them a much higher academic scholarship combined with their athletics. So uh, academics is vital. And but by merging the two, they get close to the equivalent or the equivalent of a full ride. And, and what is exactly a full ride in this day versus way back when? Well, I think Taylor said she was yeah. on a full ride, maybe not. Well, you know what? It, it really depends. Uh, there's, and I won't mention the school, but um, there is one Division One school that the full ride also includes eight hundred dollars a month spending money. So what? it's everything. Yep. <laughs> now that may money. not be for public uh it may not be for public consumption which is why i'm not mentioning the school but i know they're not the only school that would do that Amazing. that's a school with a lot of money yeah there's aren't there there i would say there aren't very many of those even on the ncaa side well and then coming out of covid i don't remember certain right Stanford was shutting down a lot of their programs because of the impact that it had. And I suspect this you know, hold true on a lot of other smaller schools, Division threes, and even smaller that don't have a lot of academic or athletic funding. Yeah, uh, so it's there's there's not a lot of money. There, you know, there's there's less money to go around right now than there has been. Like for example. Um, with with COVID closing down campuses for the most part last year. Um, so actually going back to last spring, um, like I know that like, for example, one U sports program, um, their athletic department, the, the athletic department as a whole, they lost something like $3 million from the closure of campus for just the spring semester. And spring semester is short, right? Because because no student because they weren't running anything on campus which means that no students were on campus that means that there's no student fees and a lot of at canadian universities at least um their athletic departments funding comes in big part from student fees so without student fees like a lot there are a lot of athletic departments that took major hits wow. so fast forward to next year beyond because we were touching on the 22 grad class so already filling the pipelines roster new fold what each uh, as the last takeaway before we wrap up, when should girls start this process? You said it, grade ten. I would, I would, I would see. You, yeah, I would look at reaching out in grade ten, um, oh. grade grade eleven at the at the absolute latest. Because again, as as we mentioned, if you leave it until grade twelve, that's that's far too late. The earlier you reach out, the better. Um, even if you don't know what kind of school you want, what you're interested in studying, like that's okay. Um, but the more schools you reach out to, uh, the more doors you keep open for yourself, right? It's better to give yourself the opportunity to say no to someone than wish you had a door open somewhere, you know, wish you had someone to say yes to. So it's, you know, just we we know, we understand that, that 
you know, young student athletes, like they may not know exactly what they want and their, their interests may evolve over time, uh, you know, during the high school years, but you're doing your, you're going to do yourself a lot of favors by just reaching out generally. Um, Cause again, we understand that, that your interests may change. Um, so I would, I would definitely recommend, uh, you know, I typically, so I, I make a strict rule of not watching anything uh, younger than the U18 age group. And so basically the first time I see players is grade 10. And I do, I, I do quite a thorough evaluation of, of all grade 10 players. And that's where I start because for me, I want to see the year after year. I don't want players who, you know, when I'm recruiting for university, I don't want players who are the best players in grade 11 or grade 12. I want players who are going to be who I project to be the best players in two or three years from now, right? So I'm going to look at where you were in grade 10 and how how you've grown year after year. So if you again reach out to me early, I can start to zero in on you and again start to build that relationship with you in grade 10. Whereas if I'm if if you weren't on my radar and I didn't get a chance to see you, I don't have an email from you, I don't know who you are. I'm only taking. I'm only starting to look at you late, and that that puts you at a disadvantage. Is there the early bloomer conundrum in female scouting, like there may be in male scouting? Yeah. So well, how how do we avoid that? Well, so like by early, do you mean in terms of uh, players getting attention earlier? Well, getting attention early, or and or being ignored when they are a late bloomer, because there's a I'll use the, um, the hockey analogy. Um, there's a lot of players that start peaking at 17, 18, 19. They weren't even on a radar screen. Um, captain of Dallas Stars, and his name is completely eluding me right now, but he didn't really peak until 18, 19. Hockey Canada didn't even have their radar screen until 19. So when I say early bloomer, them not being on the radar screen because of them not peaking too soon. Yep, and that's where emailing, that's where emailing, you know, can can do yourself favors, right? Because so a player that I had committed for 2021 to Laurentian, who unfortunately that's, you know, with the program folding there, um, I believe she's actually in the ACHA. She she winds up going to the ACHA key. Um, but she was not a good player in grade 10. <laughs> um, she was playing a U18 AA, but really um, very, extremely mediocre uh, is probably a compliment, <laughs> but she felt, you know, she had reached out and so, you know, had an idea of what she was like in grade 10. So then when I saw her in grade 11, it blew me away how much she had improved. Again, she still wasn't, you know, there were still plenty of other, other forwards in grade 11 who were better than she was, but the amount of improvement she showed from grade 10 to grade 11, like it was, it was astounding. And, you know, like players, so like the, you know, you don't, number one, you're not going to improve like that without, without an incredible work ethic, not at that age. Right. And so that then my interest in her went way up because I'm seeing, okay, like this is a pretty significant amount of improvement late. Like a lot of times those players are going to continue, if, you know, are going to continue or they had, you know, and she already has traits like in terms of the character aspects because had, had reached out and started to get to know her and the work ethic. So those are players that, that, that we can work with. And I can right. kind of speak to like the late bloomer side of that too, because I mean, I was in junior, like after I graduated high school, so this is like after grade 12 is when I entered into the PWHL and then I ended up getting recruited to go and play at the university level after that. So it's, it's not to say that if you are late to the scene or if you're a late bloomer that you can't make it to the university level, but rather like it's obviously better to start when you're younger and start to build those relationships with recruitment officers and also like mm -hmm. the coaches of those teams. So you can have a better shot at being at the school that you want to be at rather than getting like picked last for for a certain school yeah. right yep absolutely yeah it absolutely is not impossible to 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 get picked up by a team if you know if you're only coming on radars in grade 12 or as a post grad but you're making it you know like by not reaching out you're making it you're making you're you're you're, you're setting up a more challenging road for yourself all right so i think we've got it so wrap we've uh, we see that 60 minute 
I, I can't thank uh, Pete and Sasha Taylor. I'm glad to, hopefully we've got we planted the seed. We've got a series in the making. We can hopefully keep this going. But the insight they shared was like eye opening for me. And I, I'm in this space. I'm like literally working on my decks for this coming weekend for BC Hockey Hockey Canada. And there's some stuff I'm like, whoa, that's an eye opener. But it's obviously on the female side. I don't know how many differences, but it's more at the high that high level of girls and or boys that are aspiring to play at a really high level. So kudos to all the work that you've done and hopefully this season and beyond when we come out of this COVID craziness, it'll get better. Imagine the last you know what, 50, 18 months has been a challenge for I know all of us, but uh, thank you so much for being part of this and thanks for the insight. Uh, Taylor, do you have anything else to add to wrap up? Uh, I mean, besides a big fat thank you to Pete and Sasha for, um, you know, kind of uh, tagging along with the last couple months of planning this. I know it's been kind of a pain, but it's been really nice to, to actually see it finalize and be here in person. So thank you guys so much for contributing to this. This means so much to me, and I hope that it provides a lot of good information and resources for the young players so they can start to build that future and their hockey career as well. Well, thank you so much for having us. You know, we're honored that uh, you invited us to open up the series for you. Oh, that was awesome. And we'll get you copies of the decks so you can share it out and continue to share it out going forward. So I really enjoyed watching that. It was like a, a epiphany moment. So thanks for the insight and best wishes for the rest of the day, week and beyond. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.